In this video, I will show you how to use Entity Framework Core Migrations. Migrations allow creating a database from a set of C-sharp classes that we call a model. As the model evolves, migrations allow keeping the model in sync with the database. In this tutorial, I will show you how to enable migrations in Visual Studio, how to create a database using a migration, and how to revert or roll back changes using migrations. Let's get into it. You can work with EF Core in two ways. You generate a model from an existing database. This approach is called database first. Or you encode a model, then you use migrations to create a database. This approach is called code first. With the code first approach, there is a challenge to keep the database schema up to date with the current state of the model. Migrations will help with that. Let's start by creating a project in Visual Studio. I'm going to create a new console app. The type of app is not that important. The goal is to demonstrate migrations. I will use a local instance of SQL Server as the database. In order to work with SQL Server, I'm going to need to install two NuGet packages. Let's open the NuGet package manager window and search for Entity Framework. The first package we need is microsoft.entityframeworkcore.sqlserver. This package helps connect to the database. The second package we need is microsoft.entityframeworkcore.tools. This package allows running migrations from the NuGet package manager window in Visual Studio. We will see some of the comments later. The packages are installed. In order to work with Entity Framework, we need to create a model. I will create a database that stores jobs for a job listing website. Let's create a new folder. I will name it Models. Inside this folder, I'm going to add a new class and I name it Job. Let's introduce some properties that describe a job. The ID property is the primary key. A job has a title and a description. Next, we need a data context. Let's add a new folder. I will name it data. Inside this folder, I create a new class. I call it job context. A data context must inherit from the DB context class. Next, I expose a DB set property of jobs. This property can be used to query jobs in the database. Next, I'm going to override a method named onConfiguring. This method allows to configure the database needed by the context. The method use seeker server on the DB context options builder allows setting the connection string to the database. This connection string points to my local database. The initial catalog parameter will be the name of the database. Now it's time to create the database using our first migration. For that, I go into the menu and I select tools, then Nugget package manager, and then package manager console. In the package manager console, the command we need is add dash migration. I need to provide a name for the migration. I name it create database. If I execute this command, you can see that the migration has been created. What exactly is a migration? If you look into the project folder, you can see that a migration folder has been created and it has two files inside. The first one is a file with a timestamp and the name of the migration. The second one is a file that starts with the job context and then model snapshot. The migration file has two methods, an up method and a down method. The up method, you can see that this code will create a table named jobs with the ID, a title and a description. 
and the primary key will be on the ID column. The down method has code needed when reverting the migration. This code will drop the jobs table. The snapshot file has code that represent the state of the model after applying a migration. This file helps Entity Framework to compute the next migration. Let's return to the Package Manager console. I use another command, update database. You can add the parameter verbose to output the generated SQL statement. Let's execute this. You can see that the migration has been applied. If we take a look into the output window, you can see the SQL statement for creating the jobs table. You can also see the statements for inserting data into a table named EF Migrations History. Let's go to the database. You can see that there is a job listing database. The database has two tables. The first one is EF Core Migration History. EF Core will use this table to compare the migrations inside it to the ones in the project. If it detects that there are migrations in the project that are not in the history table, it will apply them. The second table is mapped to the job entity in our model. You can see that it has all the columns we define into the model. Now let's say we want to store the date at which a job was created. For that, I add a new date time property. I name it creates at. If we want this change to be reflected in the database, we need to create a new migration. I name it add created at column. If we take a look at the migration file, you can see in the app method that the code will add a new column in the jobs table. In the down method, the code will drop the column. EF Core knows what changes to generate by comparing the snapshot and the model. Let's apply this migration. If we take a look into the database, you can see that we have a created at column. Now let's introduce a change. Let's say that the created at column can accept null values. I'm going to update the job class and make created at nullable. Then I'm going to create a new migration, make created at nullable. Let's take a look at the migration. The code will alter the column created at and make it nullable. But let's imagine that we don't want to apply this migration. How can we revert it? We will use the command remove migration. This will remove the last migration from the project. If the command runs successfully, you can see in the output, remove migration and revert the model snapshot. If we take a look into the migration folder, you can see that the migration has been deleted and the snapshot has also been updated. In the snapshot, you can see that the created at field is required. It doesn't accept null. That's the behavior we expect when reverting the migration. But the model didn't change. I can create the migration again. This time, let's actually apply it against the database. If we check the database, you can see that the created at column now accepts null values. Let's pretend again that applying this migration was a mistake. How can we revert a migration that is already been applied? We can use the remove migration and provide the parameter force. This will undo the migration in the database and will also remove the migration from the project. Let's execute the migration. You can see that it says that it reverts the migration and remove it. If we check in the project folder, 
the migration is gone. If we check in the database, the created at column is back to its previous state. Let's update the job class and restrict the size of the title by using the max length attribute. I create a new migration, limit title size to propagate changes to the database. You can see that I receive a warning stating that I may lose some data. This is normal because I'm changing the size of a column in the database. If there is data, with a title bigger than the max, it will be truncated. In the migration file, in the app method, the title will change. It will be limited to 100 characters. I'm going to apply the migration with the update database command. If I check into the database, you can see that the title is now restricted to 100 characters. So let's do the same for the description. I create a new migration and I receive the warning again because the operation may result in data loss. Let's apply the migration. If I refresh the database, you can see that the restriction has been applied to the description column. Now, let's say you need to go back in time before those changes were done. If you look into the migration history, if you don't want to take into account the two last migrations, you will need to use the update database command. By the way, if you want to get the list of all migrations from the console, you can use the get migration command. It will show you all the migrations in the folder. I use the update command, but this time I supply the migration parameter. The parameter is the name of the migration I want to go back to. In this case, I want to go back to add created add column. If I execute this command, you see in the output, it reverts the two latest migrations. If I go into the database, in the migration history table, the migrations after add created at column have been removed. And if I refresh the columns, the latest changes have been canceled. The migration themselves have not been deleted. So they're just, they were just reverted. Let's say I want to fix a bug or something. I can do that and then use the update database command to apply the migration again. So if I go into the database in the migration history, you can see that the migration are back. If I refresh the columns, you can see that the restriction appear again. Let's say I want to create a view. I will need to use some row SQL. For that, I'm going to use the command add migration. I name my migration create view. You will notice I didn't change anything to the model. So this will create an empty migration. You can see that the up method and the down method are empty. I'm free to add some SQL statements here. Let's create the SQL statement for creating a view. The name of the view is get all data. To keep things simple, I will fetch all the data from the jobs table. Next, I can invoke the SQL method on the migration builder and pass the query statement. In the done method, the SQL is pretty simple. I drop the view. I also invoke the SQL method on the migration builder. That's it. The migration is created. Now I can apply the migration. If I execute this, 
you can see that the migration has been applied. So let's check into the database. You can see the view get all data. Of course, I'm not going to execute this because I haven't inserted any data. Sometimes you can't apply migrations in a production environment. You will need to generate a SQL script for a database admin. For that, I will use the command script migration. If I execute this command, it creates a script that can be used by someone to execute it against the database or to perform some kind of fine tuning. This concludes this video about migrations. I hope this tutorial was helpful to you. If it was, please like the video and subscribe for more. Thanks for watching. See you next time.